it's thinking about it. There we go. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the seventh episode of Focus On. Uh, my name is Retro. I'm a contributor at the Sustainable Ecosystem Scale and Core Unit, and I'm joined by Juan, our facilitator. And today we're hosting Eric Rapp from the Real World Finance Core Unit. Uh, Eric is going to be presenting the real world asset lending principles that he and his team uses to evaluate uh, real world asset deals and uh, touch on the Monetalis uh, risk profile uh, a little bit at the end of the conversation, using it as a case study to facilitate our conversation here. Uh, as you have questions, uh, please feel free to drop them in the chat or the QA function and uh, we'll address them during a pause in the action or at the end. So with that, Eric, the floor is yours. Let me get your screen shared here and sure. take it away. Is, is it, or are we shared okay? All right, good. Hi, my name is Eric Rapp. I'm in the RWA group. Uh, you know, in terms of background, I've been in traditional finance in various sh uh, shapes and forms for about 20 plus years. You know, lately uh, I've been more in FinTech and then now in DeFi. And I, I just want to share with folks, you know, in the RWA group, how do we think about um, looking at, you know, potential transactions? You know, at the end of the day, Maker is basically a senior lender, hopefully senior secured, you know, and how do you look at this? You know, what are kind of the principles? What are some of the key processes? You know, hopefully this will help folks get a better idea of how we look at things. You know, we're certainly open to innovation and criticism. You know, we're not saying we have the only way. Uh, on the other hand, I will say, you know, a lot of what we're using has been developed. <laughs> In the real world for hundreds of years, people have lost a lot of money over the centuries, you know, not doing things certain ways. And there, there, there's a rough way of doing things. It's not perfect, but I think there, there's some key principles that, that if you want to innovate, it, you should learn the key principles in the real world first and then figure out where you best think you can break them and not because you don't want to innovate in how to find ways to lose money. Okie doke. So in terms of the outline here, I want to first talk a bit about how it is crypto lending, kind of the maker core product compared to uh, real, real world lending. There's some similar, similarities and there's some definite differences. Then I want to talk a bit about the investment grade standard. You know, it's what we're you know, roughly trying to hit. Um, then I want to talk you know, more about how do we actually assess risk, a bit more sense of the process. Then let's talk a bit about you know, how can you take a, a pool of non-investment grade loans and create an investment grade senior part of it. You know, it, it's kind of this remarkable trans, uh, transformation, structured finance, or maybe the full $100 million. Uh, you know, say there's uh, 100 loans of a million dollars each and they're not investment grade. But if you put them all together, can maybe the top 70 or 80% be investment grade? You know, it, it, assuming the other part of it, you know, takes all the losses and absorbs the risk first. <laughs> that, that's part of the magic. Uh, then, you know, I want to talk a bit about the Monetalis facility, you know, in terms of risks, you know, returns and how, how does it compare you know, in, in, uh, in terms of how we look at it. I, I know there's been a lot of publicity in the forum about it. So I, I think it's very fair to try to give folks a sense, our perspective. It's not the only perspective. You know, we're not the yay or nay, but using these different tools that we will have gone through, we're, we're going to apply into Monetalis. Um, then I want to talk a bit about an arm's length transaction standard which I think is, is, is a key thing, and I'll explain why down the road. And then finally, let's talk a bit about die stability risk. I think some of these topics are quite in-depth and can have their own discussion site, i.e. die stability risk, but it, it's, it's a concept we really need to use when thinking about um, making uh, loans to different counterparties. So with that in mind, I will take it away. All right, so when we think about Maker's crypto lending business, you know, what's our basic strategy? You know, how does Maker get comfort that it's going to get paid back almost all the time? Because, you know, at the end of the day, what are our vaults? Maybe yield 2 or 3%. So if you're only getting 2 or 3% a year for the risk you're taking, that kind of tells you, you know, you're, you're only going to make money if you get your money back almost all the time. You know, if you're losing money 10% of the time, you're probably coming out um, underwater. Needless to say, I think we're doing a good job because we're, we're consistently making money. But keep that in mind. If you're only earning a small amount, you know, per year on your assets, you know, your loans, like two or three percent, that pretty much tells you how much risk you can take. You know, i.e., not much. If you were earning twenty or thirty percent a year, you know, on, on your assets, you could take a different type of risk. All right. So, how do we loan? Uh, or how do we uh, make crypto loans? You know, if you want to open a vault with your Bitcoin or ETH, one, it's it's going to be supported by a, a crypto asset that's locked in our vault. So it's secured is, is what we would say. 
you know, Maker controls that collateral. Maker controls that specific crypto asset. So if there's any you know issues about getting repaid, we, we're the first person to hold it. That's a big, big deal in the lending world. You know, you could probably say 90% of uh, of of the law is who possesses the asset. And since we have it locked in our crypto vault, we possess it. Big deal. Two, another big deal is senior. In a sense, we're the only creditor supported by that asset, or at least we're the only creditor who's allowed to get paid back from that asset in our vault until we're all, you know, until we're made whole. You know, maybe they have someone else who they owe money to, but the other creditor has no rights or has no ability to get to that collateral until we're happy that we've been paid off. Senior and secured, big, big deals. Um, and over collateralized, you know, again, say if we had a million dollar, we loaned a million dollars to someone on ETH. You know, ETH is pretty, pretty risky. You know, you've seen days when it could be down five or 10%. So we would, if we loan someone a million dollars in ETH, you know, we'd probably want to have what, a, at least a million three, a million four, you know, you've got this extra collateralization. So, you know, if things go a little sideways, you know, prices of the ETH decline, you still have enough to get out of there timely and get all your money back. Uh, again, th these are, I think, defining principles of crypto lending. And also, I think these you're going to see these are defining principles in most lending. Um, and now these next three are defining principles in crypto, but less so in our real world assets. One, it's fungible. You know, like a Bitcoin is a Bitcoin. You know, ETH is ETH. So the secure assets are, are you know, are, they're all uh, homogenous, at least in their group. You know, this is all Bitcoin. This is all ETH. We know exactly what it is. You know, there's nothing really idiosyncratic. Two, transparent. The prices of, of these, you know, be it Bitcoin or ETH, are observable and frequently updated. You know, these things tend to trade 24-7 worldwide. So, you, you know, we know uh, as a lender what the price is at any given time. And, you know, we can see if, if the, uh, the uh, debt ceilings are, you know, are starting to come under pressure. You know, is it time, you know, to have a liquidation? You know, it, does it hit the trigger level? Again, this is a very big deal because you know what your collateral is, you know what it's worth, and you know you can get out quickly and you're over collateralized. Mm. And finally, when I said, you, you know, you can get out quickly, that implies the last point, liquidity. You know, the, uh, the working assumption, which is, I think, roughly, it's been proven, is the asset can be sold near, near the market price pretty easily, you know, at least in, in reasonable scale. You know, if I wanted to move 10 billion, no. But, you know, when we want to move several, you know, tens of millions out of a big vault, it can be done. So from my perspective, I'm going to I'm claiming and I'd love to hear people's views to the contrary, that this is really what makes crypto lending, you know, a very, you know, re or a good, safe strategy and why we're making money. You know, I think these are very important principles. And I, I imagine if you asked our risk folks or even our growth folks, um, do you want to start, you know, uh, lessening some of these key principles around lending you know, to crypto? I, I think they would be concerned. They'd say, Eric, you know, these are important. <laughs> this is how we make sure we get our money back. Because there's a saying in, in lending, like lending money is easy. Getting paid back is the hard part. So these are your all principles to make sure we get paid back. All right. If we flip to the next slide, let's talk a bit about the crypto, which we just discussed, versus real world lending strategy. In the real world, you know, see, I, I've lined up the same basic items on the left, and then where do they overlap and where they don't? Real world is senior. We want to be, you know, the first lender to get paid back. It's typically secured. You know, we want to take collateral. Um, it's over collateralized. You know, we want more collateral than what the loan is. So if there's some losses, you know, someone else eats those before we ever get hurt. On the other hand, it's not fungible. You know, if I have a pool of auto loans, not all pool of auto loans are identical. You know, uh, there could, you know, if there's 400 different pools of auto loans out there, they're all going to be somewhat different. Um, so, you know, everything's a bit of a snowflake. Next, transparency around pricing. Typically, um, you know, most loans aren't actively sold, you know, or at least the consumer loans, you know, $5,000 credit card or something, or even small business loans, maybe fifty, dollars $100,000. You could get a bid for them, but there's not really an active, clear market, you know, to get it priced. You know, typically... That's why you get these financing structures. If you have, um, you know, a hundred million dollars of small business loans, you put them all together in a pool and, you know, then you issue bonds against them. So instead of selling them one by one, you're creating this more complicated structure. Uh, we'll talk more about, you know, how we need to create that structure so the market, you know, likes it. But again, you don't really have active pricing in near the same way. That's a big difference. And then uh, related to that is liquidity. 
you know, if, if it's not priced and, and not necessarily well understood, you, it's not easy to sell. You know, if you have your 400 auto loans and you're like, all right, I'm done with this. I want out. You're eventually going to find a bid. But, you know, it could take weeks or months, you know, and maybe it's 90 cents on the dollar. You know, there, there's no idea that, it's, boom, you're out the door and gone. So, you know, these are all, you know, very important principles. Uh, and let, let, let's keep going here. All right. So then what does RWA do given that we don't have the fungibility, the transparency on pricing or liquidity to sell kind of at will that crypto does? Here, here's, you know, from my perspective and actually on my team, roughly what do we layer on as risk mitigants given that we don't have these other key things that the crypto folks uh, who are making loans do? We want quality cash flowing assets. You know, so if you have a, a pool of um, credit cards, you know, you have a pretty good sense of how good the borrowers are, you know, and, and how much money you should get paid back. You know, you don't want assets where you don't understand the performance. You know, that, that's probably like the worst thing, because if you step back a bit, a lot of what we're doing in um, RWA is we're not lending a, a against a price, you know, a market observable for the crypto collateral. And we know we get out at, at the market price. What we're basically saying is, look, we're putting a pool of cash flowing assets together and the principal and interest generated by them over time is more than enough to safely pay off our loan. And so if it's a two year loan, you know, we'd want to have, you know, a comfortable margin from this pool of credit cards, you know, that even if you know there's some economic distress that we're still going to get paid off, you know, timely. You know, so that's a big deal. Um, and then it's not just quality cash flowing. You know, in terms of like the deal structure, you know, you typically want a diversified pool uh, with stable, you know. Uh, so in terms of diversified, you wouldn't want everyone, you know, to necessarily live in California in the same zip code. You know, it, it's going to depend by deal, but you're typically, you'll know, think about a few key risks and diversify across it, be it geography or, or something like that. So I, I think I, I uh, wrote this same thing twice. But so we want a diversified pool, which, you you know, you don't have in crypto. Um we, we want a pool that generates stable, predictable cash flows. And sorry, we don't have that in crypto. I've been updating this. Apologies. That's it. Say no. You know, the asset pool generating stable, predictable cash flows is not is no in crypto. You know, there are no cash flows unless you sell it. Um, all right. So that's a big deal. As I said, we want to be able to uh, have our pool of assets generate enough cash flow to pay our loan off safely over time. Um, also, you know, there's in the deal structure, you're going to want to have credit enhancement, which which is in some ways it's very similar. The same thing as uh, over collateralization. But, the, you know, there's other some you know kind of more fancy ways to slice and dice risk. You know, we'll come back to it. Uh, you know, but there's a lot of different ways to try to mitigate risk using structural things. And then finally, again, I'll say this is within deal structure. You want to align the borrower as best you can with maker the lender. You know, typically the borrow and lender, you know, you're, you're not really well aligned. You know, every extra percent of interest rate I charge, you know, is money out of his net income. You know, so kind of you're fighting over the same economic pie. But as a lender, you know that the borrower knows a lot more about his business and has a lot of decisions to make that you can't tell him what to do. So as much as you can, you want to create a scenario where he's aligned to make decisions that are in your interest. And we'll talk about things, but alignment is a big one. You know, there's a classic joke in like Chicago, you know, where Chicago has the trading pits. They call it an O'Hare trade where the, the joke is, look, go to like the board of trade, take the biggest naked like option position you can, you know, on the most volatile commodity like oil or, or crypto, if they would let you, if you could put like 10,000 down and you know, they'll, they'll give you a hundred to one leverage. So you take a $10 million position. You take the biggest position you can, then you drive to the airport. O'Hare is the international airport. You know, you call and see if the position is. If it's moved big time in your favor, you're rich. You come back, you retire. If it's moved against you and now you owe a lot of extra money, you, know, you fly to Bolivia. You know, you're like, to heck with it. So that, that's a classic example of kind of how the equity guy is not always well aligned with the lender. You, you know, as the lender, you don't want people taking these kind of big existential risks because if, if it goes well, you know, you get your 3% interest back. If it goes poorly, you could lose everything. Mm. Let's keep going here. We, we do have a lot of slides. So, all right. What is investment grade risk? You know, this is, you know, our, our, our we have a preference for investment grade. It doesn't have to be, but what does it mean? Historically speaking, you know, you, you look at the data, it means the chance of, of a debt instrument or a loan, you know, defaults, you know, comfortably under 1% a year. You know, there's specific grades within that. 
but just think something needs to default less than 1% a year. You know, the other way you'll see like rating agencies say that is it's highly likely to repay the loan as contractually specified, i.e. it makes all of its payments and doesn't default. You know, the rating agencies and credit investors, you know, all kind of use this similar view of things. They might have little differences, you know, but, but they all tend to think about, you know, what is investment grade and, and kind of have an idea of what an investment grade deal looks like across a number of key dimensions. You know, and there, people aren't perfectly agreed, but it, it, there's a rough language, you know, that will be you know talked about and argued about. All right. So that's roughly investment grade risk. Just think it's very likely to get paid back. You know, it probably defaults less than 1% a year. In terms of the uh, RWA risk assessment, you know, how do we do this? Um, well, so we look at an asset manager or a borrower, you know, across some first, some key operating areas. Well, what operating areas are most important? How do they source the collateral or the assets? You know, if it's, if it's going to be uh, unsecured personal loans like SoFi, you know, where, where do they find them, right? You really want to understand how they're getting them. I mean, is, is it consistent? Because at the end of the day, we're going to keep coming back to we want cons stable cash flows from the pool of these loans. So you want to have a stable process. You don't want them to source everything one month from one channel. And then the next month they go somewhere that's completely different and source it all there. So the performance you know, between the two pools is very different. You don't like that. How do they underwrite it? You know, Because they're ultimately going to be saying yes or no. You know, I, I want to extend a loan or I don't. That's a big deal. So how do they understand and manage their risk. Um, then next, how do they manage and service the collateral? You know, once they've invested in something, you know, how, how do they manage the ongoing loan? And if there's trouble, you know, what do they do? And then also we want to look at, you know, at their investment platform. You know, uh, wh how, what size of business can it comfortably um, service? And, in, and if they, you know, their loan is three times bigger than what they're currently doing, how are they going to get there? You know, because at the end of the day, as a lender, you're you're only going to at best cases you get your principal and your interest back you know if their business gets 10 times bigger the equity guys have made a home run you know you maybe you've got a bigger loan but but you you get nowhere near the same uh, upside as the equity guy so it's something to keep in mind and then also a big deal here is is we look at you know the collateral the underwriting the managing and servicing you you like to look at their historical performance with the same or similar collateral you know, what is the best predictor of their future returns? It's typically going to be based, you know, what have they done for the last number of years? You, you know, it's, it's almost like uh, like in sports, you know, when someone has shown an ability to do something for several years, usually that's a pretty good indicator of how it'll go in the future. And then in terms of the principles you know, that this is really looking at, you know, as we went through the key RWA principles, you know, on the right, again, it's quality cash flowing assets. That's what we want them to be originating. Um, we want a nice stable pool with predictable cash flows. And then we also want um, them to be aligned with Maker. We'll come back more on alignment, but they have lots of little decisions around sourcing, underwriting, and so forth. And we can't micromanage those decisions as a lender. Even as a TradFi lender, you don't want to. Uh, but particularly, you know, even more so as a decentralized lender. So we need to construct uh, a structure that makes them want to do things that's in our interest. All right. Risk assessment. Um, so then we look at them also in a number of non-operational areas. You know, we just talked about the operations. So we also look at management and ownership. You know, management, you know, a big one is, you know, what's their experience and track record in this area? You know, you like to uh, work with guys who've who've done this before and done it well. And, and then also teams that have worked together before. You know, there's always some risk in putting a new team together that's never worked, you know, together before because they might just not get along. Um, you want to know the financial strength of their business. You know, do they have enough capital so that they can, you know, focus on originating and servicing good collateral for you? Or are they going to be running out to have to raise new equity in six months and might take the eye off the ball, you know, and not make good investment decisions for you? Um, also, you know, as I mentioned, what's their alignment with you? It's a big deal. And are there any potential, you know, conflicts of interest? You know, why might management or ownership um, not really be thinking in your best interest? They could have other goals, you know that need to at least be disclosed and understood. And again, uh, on these non-operational um, things, again, we're trying to make sure that they're focused on generating quality cash flowing assets, you know, stable, predictable cash flows, and they're aligned uh, reasonably with the lender being maker here. Okay. And then, 
there's so essentially there's three sets here of the risk assessment. I did um, operational, then I did um, kind of non-operational things, just more looking at their business. And now we also look at the financial structure and the legal structure of the specific deal. You know, this is where, you know, everything comes together. You know, they're making a proposal and, and you look at how it all works together. You know, and then typically when you're looking at this, we're going to want to see that is it creating a diversified asset pool uh, you know, with stable, <laughs> predictable cash flows? Uh, is there good credit enhancement and other risk mitigants? And is it aligning the borrower with maker, you know, at least to a reasonable degree? You know, th these are key, key points. And I hope I sound repetitive. That's my intent. You know, lending, good lending practices, it's not rocket science. You know, there, there's just a number of key things that like around alignment and diversification. You, you just, you, you consistently want it done well. You know, through the centuries, we've seen lots of people kind of skip on these principles and it generally comes back to haunt you. All right. Let's talk a, a bit about how do you make an investment grade loan here from a non-investment grade pool. So the idea is, is, let's just give an example. So there's a sponsor or an arranger who wants to buy a pool of loans. Say there's 10 loans. Each one is 10% of the pool. Let's make this real simple. And then each loan has a 5% chance of defaulting. So I would, uh, I, I want to note that to be investment grade, you know, you, you want to have less than a 1% chance of defaulting. So each individual loan is clearly not investment grade, but is there a way to put this sucker together in a structure that we can make part of it investment grade? Now, that's what a lot of structured finance is about. Mm. So let's take the first one. Let's say maker lends 100% to the sponsor to buy the loan pool. So the sponsor, you know, tells us he's going to do a good job, but he's not putting his own money in. I mean, he's got his own business, but we're all of the, all of the money. So if you come... And look, you know, total collateral, let's just call it 100%, these 10 loans. And then the maker loan down here below is 100%. And the sponsor puts in no equity, right? So it's essentially, it's all our capital. And then can we trans, what will the um, the risk of this group of 10 uh, equal size loans be to us, you know, as the lender? Will the annual default rate be under 1%? You know, I'm, I think people are probably going to guess no, but let's let's take a look. So here's some basic statistics on, on this group of 10 loans, uh, equal sized, 5% probability of defaulting each. What's the chance no deals default? None of the loans default. It's basically, you see here, 60%. So 60% of the time, the loan performs. See over here, Y means yeah, the loan performs and it doesn't default. And there's the equity sponsor, essentially, they've put nothing in, but you know, in theory, should they be covering some loss? So there's zero default and everything goes good in the first scenario, right? With, with, with no losses. That's 60% of the time. What about if there's one of the 10? You know, this is just you know, basic um, probabilities here. If one defaults, that is going to happen almost 32% of the time. So, and if that happens, we're, we have no first loss capital under us. So the sponsor equity, in a sense, there is no equity, but it, it's underwater. And does the loan perform? No, it doesn't perform, right? So uh, one of the 10 is defaulted and we absorb that loss. You know, that's not great for maker. You know, this is, uh, fair, needless to say, this is not investment grade because we need to have no more than about 1% chance of defaulting. How many loans would this have to be able to absorb? If we come down to uh, cumulative probability, I sum the individuals. So the first chance is zero default. Uh, no more than zero defaults is 60. Then what's the chance of, no more than one default. That's just the sum of zero defaults plus one default. So I sum 59.9 and 31.5. So 91.4% of the time, um, we get no more than one default. So that's still not investment grade. You know, we need to be at like 99% uh, percent no defaults. So if we come down to two defaults, um, then we sum, you know, the 59.9 plus the 31.5 plus the 7.5, we get 98.8. So we're almost at 99. So in essence, you know, to be investment grade, this is telling us you'd have to be able to absorb two defaults or less, you know? And so it's kind of the ideas I'm trying to plan in people's heads here is you somehow need to put in enough capital, first loss capital, that's not the maker loan that will absorb this first 20% default, you know, to create something quasi investment grade, you need to do a little better than that the sponsor puts no money in. So then the next question is, and I hope this is kind of a leading is, is, is let's look at this and structuring it differently. Maker now lends 80% to the sponsor to buy the loan pool. 
So again, it's 100% of the assets, same asset side of the balance sheet. Maker now only puts in 80 and the sponsor puts in 20, 20%. This is a big difference. And then it's not put in in, in a pro rata. We don't share um, losses and, 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 and um, income equally with uh, the, the uh, sponsor equity. The sponsor absorbs the first losses and Maker will only take a loss after the, uh, the sponsor's capital is all gone. This is essentially what senior means with a senior loan. We're senior to uh, their capital, so they eat the losses. This is a typical lending um, a lending uh, approach. And then, so the question becomes, you know, is this investment grade, i.e., you know, is, is not this whole thing, but is the maker loan investment grade? Does it have less than a 1% probability of default? Let's take a look. Ah, sorry, let, let me move this. I somehow, uh, all right, here we go. So here, again, you can see where I use the red. The red is where uh, the loan stops performing. You know, so you can see uh, with this new structure, again, remember the sponsor has 20% equity. So the first 20% of losses to the pool are on them. Again, zero default. The loan, of course, it per of course it performs. There's no losses. The sponsor equity is untouched. If there's one loss, the, we're assuming you know there's no recovery, so the 10% uh, of, of the uh, capital disappears, it, but the sponsor absorbs the loss, right? So then their sponsor equity after the loss is 10%. It still performs. Why does it perform? Because the sponsor is taking the first loss. We're not taking it. Even if there's two losses, that means 20% of the assets disappear without, without us getting paid back. We don't like it, but the sponsor absorbs all 20%. So we just get out kind of by the skin of our teeth. So the loan performs. So in essence, for the first three scenarios, uh, when there's no more than two defaults, we are okay. If there's three defaults, what happens? 30% of the pool is gone. The sponsor only put in 20%. So now the sponsor is gone, but that additional 10% comes to us and we take a loss. It doesn't perform, right? I, I hope this is clear. This is kind of the break right here, but you can see how much more resilient this is. How often do you get three losses um, or, or three, yeah, three defaults or more in the pool? Essentially, it's a little, you know, a little over 1%. It's like 1.2% of the time. So it's not quite investment grade, but it's very close. So if we flip back, we can see when there's no capital under us, zero defaults is the only time our senior, our senior loan performs. When there's 20% first loss under us, you know, we make it all the way up to two defaults, which is a big deal, right? You know, this is one of the key things in structured finance, you know, having a nice pool that's predictable and then some nice first loss capital under you to absorb these potential losses. So let's talk a bit about Monetalis, you know, as, as we've gone through the um, kind of the, the, the machinery uh, of how we look at lending and, and these principles in the real world, our RWA, how would we think about Monetalis? And I don't mean to pick on them, but it is a well-known one in, in the, uh, in the community and it's you know there's i think there's a vote coming and we believe you know in terms of radical de defi transparency we want to be transparent fully transparent on how we look at things you know and have a discussion you know maybe we're missing something so what is monetalis uh they aim to do wholesale wholesale lending in the uk to small medium enterprises and with a green focus which we like it's good to be a green focus uh initially they asked for 400 million they come back since and said now they're asking for 40 million, you know, so it's it's not a huge amount, but it's it's real money. 40 million is over half of our uh, capital surplus. Their uh, their request or their proposal is to pay a 2% stability fee to us. Um, and then also this will, we'll see this later, but they would get a 1% management fee to run their business and they get 20% of the uh, profits. You know, the one in 20 is, you know, ballpark in how these, you know, how some of these deals can be done. So when RWA, RWF, same thing, thinks about this, how do we assess Monic Talis proposal? You know, what are the glasses we wear? Hopefully this is sounding, this is going to sound repetitive. Um, is it investment grade? You know, we talked about that. Is it a good risk adjusted return for maker? You know, when we think of what else is out there, uh, um, you know, it's it, not that it has to be like on market, you know, the best deal out there, but if it's a big deviation from what else is out there, I think it's worth having the discussion because then in our, if you give a, a really, how do I want to put this? If you lend money to someone where it's not a very good deal for you, you 
you're subsidizing their business in a sense if you could do a lot better elsewhere. So then I think you, you want to think about why you're doing it. And it very well could be a good reason to do it, like the green focus. Um, and then the next question is, because is this transaction a good standard for other transactions? You know, once we approve, at least from the risk guys, we don't approve. Once we bless it and say we like it, we know we're going to get lots of other folks coming and wanting, you know, sp same basic standard. You know, so once you set a standard as a, you know, as a lender, you're going to have a lot of folks expecting to come you know, with, with a very similar standard. So, you know, you, you want to be waving in you know, all that kind of business. And then finally, and I'll talk about this more towards the end, would it be viewed as arm's length? You know, we'll talk about that, but arm's length is basically, is it viewed as kind of like an, uh, a reasonable market transaction where both sides, the lender and the borrower, are acting independently in their own interest? You know, th this is uh, something I think we want to be careful with, at least from our perspective, you know, in risk in the RWA group is, you know, in, in traditional finance, you, you've seen a lot of times people get in trouble when when a company's you know, making a loan to some subsidiary and it's not really doing it at, at, at market terms. You know, and there's, there's, there, there can be a question of is there some insider dealing and you know, who, who's kind of getting the better deal and why? I mean, I, I think the optics of this really matter and we'll come back to it. But it, it's certainly it, it, it's something to keep in mind. All right. Oh, sorry. And then ah, I, I, I've kind of I, I've messed up my slide order, but I, I, I do want to make just a review how we're going to look at Monetalis. So we talked about structuring investment uh, grade loan. We, you know, we talked about the, these key steps here. Um, good quality assets and create cash, diversified asset pool, um, uh, good uh, alignment, good uh, stable cash flows. These are all important. And I just want to note and kind of a shout out to uh, Christian and, and the legal side. We don't just say, hey, here's a quick uh, term sheet. You know, all of this is done. Making sure all of these steps are done takes a lot of legal structuring and analysis. It's, it's you know, unlike crypto where you can just take their crypto collateral in a vault and then liquidate if you need. This all you know, has to have these agreements and the collateral, you know, we need to have legal agreements that we can actually take the collateral if needed and enforce our rights and remedies. Um, it, it's, it's a pain in the neck, but you, you to be a, a good lender, you really need to have all these rights and remedies. And if you don't, it, 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 it's troubling and that's how, a good way to lose money. Okay. So when we think about Monetalis, what are the key risks? Let's first structure, you know, how we're going to think about this. One, the facility risk, the money, you know, we, we call a loan a facility. If Monetalis uh, and its investments underperform, you know, we could lose capital. That's clearly a cl obvious risk. I think there's a more subtle one that's ultimately probably more important longer term for a maker when we think about how we're lending is what's the stability risk to the die you know at the end of the day the, the market you know folks holding die you know look at it and say this is uh convertible one for one into dollars but that's only true if there's really good collateral backing it you know right now we have a lot of usdc that's good stuff but what if we all put it into say uh bitcoin could be worth a whole lot more in a few months could be worth a whole lot less you know that would put it stability risk so the market really wants to see that we've got solid collateral with a good structure and and, and a good manager you know good managers who know what they're doing and, and you know if you if you ever pay any attention to kind of the history of bank runs you'll see uh banks getting in trouble when uh people don't think their assets are good and then people trying to get their money out quickly because if there's a perception there's not enough good collateral to back you know your deposits you want to be the first one to get paid back because maybe the last guy isn't gonna get paid back at all and so there's clearly a parallel you know in kind of our world where someone thinks the die isn't worth 100 percent on average you want to be the first guys to get 100 cents back and then maybe the last guys get much less and we do not want um we do not want to create that perception or risk and a lot of it has to do with perception all right, so when we think about the facility risk of Monetalis, we, we, we were looking really at three areas. One is the manager themselves. Two is the asset, you know, they're making loans against a green small business collateral. And three, it's the structure, it's the deal itself. You know, and, and, and you know, we'll, we'll go through these three. And then typically, if there's a major deficiency in any, you know, kind of these areas, it's usually not investment grade. Investment grade has a numerical element, but there's also kind of a qualitative element where you'd say, okay, let's look at this manager. This manager, 
you know, has never managed this kind of asset before. You know, it, it's hard to put an investment grade number on it because you'd say, well, what's, you know, what's the chance the collateral is going to perform really well? And you say, well, what's his track record? And they say, well, he doesn't have a track record, you know, in this or a similar type of collateral. So it, it gets hard to make, you know, a very confident statement, you know, about the consistency of the cash flows to pay you back. Okay. But yeah, at the end of the day, we're going to think about manager risk, asset risk, and structural risk. So let's go through them one by one. All right. Manager. How, how do we look at uh, Monetalis and their manager? One, I think, you know, Alessio uh, and Alan are very talented guys. You know, Alan has a lot of private equity experience. This is all good. Very, very re uh, respectable. But neither one has ever really been the guy running a, a private credit fund asset finance manager. So they don't really have a track record. And, you know, you can't say, wow, over the last four years, you know, here's what they did across their deals. So it gets very hard to predict their performance, given they've never really done this specific thing before. That's definitely a concern. Next, is there a startup asset manager? You know, it's a business model that you think probably makes sense, but they don't have the last several years to show you um, that they, they made money at it. And they also are going to need to scale up pretty quickly. You know, it's kind of going from zero to 60 very quickly. From an equity risk, you know, that could be a great risk. But to a lender, you know, you typically like to have, you know, business already going a bit, you know, because at the end of the day, as a lender, we want to be taking risk on the assets. We don't want it to, them, to, you know, managers to be using our capital to essentially subsidize their equity, if you will. You know, because traditionally, you know, um, borrowers always want to get more capital from the uh, lender and, you know, in less equity, you know, so they don't have to dilute themselves. But as the lender, you want to be careful. Is some of our debt capital implicitly being used in kind of equity like functions? In startup situations, there's definitely a risk of that. Um, Monetalis is also, you know, it's relatively thinly capitalized, you know, not profitable. You know, it's just starting. So, Will they need more equity funding given they're not making money out of the door? Will they need to raise more money from investors in, say, six or eight months? You know, and if they are, are they going to be really busy raising equity as opposed to, you know, thinking about or, or, or origin, uh, making good loans and managing our collateral well? You know, th there's that's an alignment issue. You know, it's not clear they you know, always be focused on what we wanted them to be focused on. Also, um, the way they're, they propose this, they're not putting in any first loss position. You know, maker is 100% of the investment. You know, if there's any little, oops, we made a loss, it very well could hit us. Um, you know, so it, it certainly raises our, la our our chances of losses. And it's also, again, kind of a question of um, alignment. You know, I mean, how committed are they to the business? And then finally, it's an interesting thing where the way they propose this, maker's been doing this some, but it's traditionally not done in the real world. And I think it's really worth thinking about. Let me explain. They propose that this loan, this facility can be liquidated at will um, based on the votes. You know, if, if the token holders vote, we could get rid of it. At first glance, you're like, all right, this is a good way to mitigate risk. I got it. OK. But on the flip side, if we can pull their capital at will, what's their incentive to really invest, you know, good equity dollars to really build a solid business? You know, if you're a businessman, you know, you're, you're building a lender. You know, you don't want to put like 10 million of your own money in it, knowing your hundred million dollar lender could disappear tomorrow if they don't like, you know, if they change their mind. You know, traditionally, you know, as, as a lender, you need capital stability. You need good equity to, you know, to fund your operations. Then you need good debt capital to help make your loans. And if either one of those pillars is shaky, it really makes it hard to stay focused on your business. And, it, you know, honestly, it reduces your incentive to really invest and build, you know, a really good uh, quality business. Yeah, so I mean, I think Maker needs to keep this in mind when you're dealing, you know, with real world assets. If you can pull a facility, a debt facility at will, you're really reducing uh, the incentives and alignment of a lender to make a really good uh, a good business because he can't count on you. And then if he can't count on you, you know, how, how can you put more of his own equity in it knowing it might disappear? Or if your loan disappears, it's going to really damage his equity. So there's clearly some big issues from the manager perspective. And then we also just wanted to benchmark the manager. We said they don't have a lot of credit investing experience. Not that Alan has a lot of experience in equity investing, private equity, very good experience, much better than mine. Um, but we wanted to look and he gave us a list of his competitors and there's a few other here. And we kind of you know looked at the guy running these different groups, you know, running the equivalent 
of, of like the head of the credit person, you know, similar to who would be, you know, same role Allen and Alessio would have. And you look at these guys and they typically have what, 18 years of prior credit experience before they get into that, you know, kind of leading role. You know, so again, guys have, you know, serious private credit experience before they, you know, are, are ever able to really kind of run a big uh, private asset finance business in the UK. You know, so to us, this is a real concern. You know, these guys, you know, all have lots of experience in, in track records. Let's talk a bit about the asset. You know, let me try to go a little quicker here. Um, you know, we've had a number of conversations with UK asset managers and the green asset financing is very competitive. You know, not surprisingly, you know, all the institutions want to do it. And it tends to, uh, the, the demand to finance the green business is greater than the supply. You know, so how does this play it itself out? Typically, it's a pretty relationship driven business. You know, the brokers in the middle, you know, will work with uh, financing sources that they already know and, and you know, have been there consistently. And then the guys who um, want to do the green stuff typically are going to also have to do the non green kind of middle of the fairway stuff. You know, because if the brokers like, look, you only want the green stuff. I'm going to go down to Bill down the street who does everything. You know, he's more reliable for me. So it's going to make it harder for you to get in if you want to be very green focused. Um, two, Monetalis is a new entrant. You know, it, it might have trouble sourcing quality transactions. It's just, it, you know, it's hard to break into this market. And, and third, our general observation is not that it's, it has to be true, but to break into these markets, you, you probably, there's a good chance you're going to have to pay too much, you know, so you get less yield and or taking on more risk than other folks were. You know, you got to fight your way to get your foot in the door, you know, and none of these are really great things for the lender. You know, if they had a big um, first loss piece under us, it's a little easier to say, hey, OK, if they overpay or take a little too much risk, that's OK, because, you know, like the first 20 percent of the losses is on them. You know, here, the first 100 percent of the losses are on us. So we, we have no cushion on that risk. Structure. Let's go on to structure here. So this is how the deal's actually done. You know, I'm kind of beating the dead horse here, but I, <laughs> there's no facility wide credit enhancement. Right. There's no first loss under us. First loss comes to us. You know, that clearly raises the risk. We don't like that. And then even if there is a facility-wide first loss, which we do like, we would get a lot higher credit risk just during the ramp up. Because, you know, maybe in the first three months, they make one investment. And then, you know, we don't have that group of 10 investments, you know, where you have diversification. Everything's on that one investment. You know, and then maybe they have two investments and three, but it takes months and months before you get a well-diversified pool. So that's go, you know, ex give us, you know, more lumpy early credit risk. Also, their proposal does not pay current interest. You know, th th this this is rarely done in the traditional lending world. You know, you, this is a lending relationship. And part of this is to back the die, you know, die stability. You know, we want the assets, you know, to generate cash that can be used, you know, to, to, if the die, you know, needs it. You know, it's, it's just very off market to want to not pay current interest. You know, and it doesn't really show a good alignment, you know, really managing your business to generate stable, consistent cash flow for us if we need it. So that's the, the first group of uh, structure risk. I have one more sub more structure risk. Um, they have no performance covenants on how the assets have to perform or corporate uh, per, perform, uh, performance you know, like financial health. Well, what if they're running out of money and can't pay their employees, for instance? You know, they would say, well, we can shut the whole business down at will. OK. But again, we don't like the idea of if we can shut the business down at will, that doesn't give them incentives, you know, to invest a lot and build a good business. And in a sense, we want to know, you know, how are them to commit to how the assets and then the in the uh, in their corporate business should should perform. You know, we want the business to be financially healthy. We want the assets to perform well. And you know, traditional lender, you want them to commit, you know, to levels. And if they don't hit the levels, you know, you you have a discussion with them and what needs to be done. Um, also, this is a UK pound based um, investment, which, which is, it's a fine thing, but the die is in dollars. It's dollar denominated. So it needs to be uh, hedged currency wise. You know, if they don't hedge it, a 10 percent loss in, in the dollar to the pound would mean we'd be down 10 percent. They haven't proposed a solid currency hedging strategy. You know, and we, we think that that is essential. Otherwise, you know, we're kind of taking foreign currency trading risk. So I think that needs to be there, at least for us to say it's an appropriate facility. And then also their guidelines allow like a lot of real estate up to 60 percent and up to 100 percent loans that, that don't amortize. It was, I've kind of gone on how we want good cash flowing lo loans that pay down um, our loan through principal and interest. 
real estate itself doesn't, you know, tend to um, cash flow, or at least not fully. If you have a th five year real estate loan, typically it'll pay off maybe 10% of the principal, then you have to refinance it because it's just too big an asset. So if you get all of these loans that have refinancing risk, there will not be enough P&I generated to pay off our loan. We're winding up betting more and more that the real estate markets will be able to refinance the loans, you know, four or five years down the road. Again, people do real estate lending, but it, it, it kind of changes the risk profile, you know, and it, it, it's concerning. And then let's just think, uh, we're, we're going to be out of time soon. I'll, I'll try to cl clip it up. Monetalis, we just took a quick you know, look at what's the expected return to maker. You know, the asset yield is what they would earn on their loans. You know, they pay us 2%. Uh, they would get 1% uh, to manage it. There's probably some other admin fees at 1%. So the net profit is 50 basis points, not a lot, but they propose we get 80% of that. So if you take our 2% stability fee and 80% of the 50 basis point profit, we get about 2.4%, you know, expected yield if everything goes well on this facility. How does that compare to other things is really the question. So we look, you know, like Experience UK, you know, asset focused credit funds doing similar stuff. You know, they're getting senior leverage, uh, typically at Sony up plus 100 or 1%, which is all in there paying about 1.25% and an 85% advance rate. And they also, you know, no single exposure can be more than 15%. So we'll compare this, you know, so it's definitely, it's a lower uh, interest rate, you know, it's, all, it's almost like half the interest rate of a monetalis would offer, but there's significantly different protections. And then we're also negotiating now with the big U, uh, US based credit fund that hope we want to do a deal with if, if, if we can reach terms, they're offering about 2% yield an 80% advance rate, and then a diversified portfolio. Again, we're like no more than single exposure than 15%. Again, not as much yield as monetalis, but a lot more protections. Let's skim through this with a couple matrices quickly. Uh, um, if we think about, you know, how does Monetalis look versus, um, you know, who else is out there? So we have Monetalis, then we have an experience fund. And then we're going to go through manager, asset, and uh, structure, just like before. And let's see how they line up, because this is really a very useful way to think about, you know, how what, what else is out there in the market and what's their proposal versus what else we could do. Not that it has to be the same, but how much are we giving up to do business with them? So if we think experienced credit managers, Monetalis, no, that's a big one. Experienced funds, yes, that's their core skill. Uh, are they? Is it a startup manager with lots of scaling risk? Monetalis, yes. Experienced fund, no. I mean, they've got a big existing business that's already scaled. A thin capital base, Monetalis, yes. You know, it's not clear, you know, do they have to raise more equity? The experienced funds, you know, we're looking at are you know, all making money. You know, they don't need to raise more equity. They're profitable and consistently profitable. First loss position. This is a huge one. Um, if, if, you know, if 10% of the pool, uh, of the collateral disappeared overnight in Monetalis, would they absorb that loss and we'd be fine? No, you know, there's no protection. The experienced funds, you know, are offering 15 to 20%. That's a huge one. You know, if they stub their toe, they suffer the consequences. We don't. And then also the lender can liquidate a will. Again, this is a bit of a complex one, but we don't want monetal. I mean, sorry, as maker, we'd like to be able to pull someone's facility a will on one hand, you know, if things get scary. On the other hand, we should have good covenants in, in the lending agreement where if they are performing, you know, we can pull it. We don't want to just say, we don't like you. Here's a vote, go away. Because then like experience quality um, uh, businesses aren't going to want to do business with you. You know, you, you could destroy their equity investment by pulling their line. You know, so again, Monetalis has this risk. The experienced guys aren't going to give you this, but they are going to give you, you know, lots of other kind of covenants and protections. Um, so then let's think about the asset risk comparison. It's very competitive green deals for both. Experienced fund, clearly. Existing relationships. Monetalis doesn't have them. You know, at least experienced funds will. Um, ag aggressive growth targets. You know, does Monetalis have to buy a lot of new deals to Get into business, yes. You know, the experience fund is more kind of doing what they're currently doing with some growth. Um, might they need to risk up to get into the market, you know, to build their business? Monetalis, we would think there's a good risk there. The experience fund, I mean, if, if there's a risk up, they've already been doing it, you know, right? So you've already seen it in their historical performance. You kind of know what they're doing. So again, on asset risk comparison, there's definitely a difference. And finally, on structural risk, there's once again, a lot, a lot of difference. 
facility credit wide, uh, I've mentioned this in both because here, you know, it's again, no first loss. I, I beat that to death. There's a lumpy exposure in the ramp up for Monetalis. Yes. Experience fund. No paying current interest. Monetalis. No experience fund. Definitely would expect to pay current interest. You know, it helps us back to die. Um, asset performance and corporate covenants, you know, to make sure the loans and the corporate health is good. Monetalis, there's nothing. Experience fund, there's definitely going to be some good stuff there. Currency hedging. If it's a UK fund, experience fund, they'll both have it, you know, but on the other hand, maybe they're already experienced doing it. And then loose credit guidelines. You know, Monetalis's guidelines can be tightened, but at this point, they're pretty loose. You know, we're an experienced fund. They tend to be tighter. And then they've also got performance history with the existing guidelines. So you know how they've done, you know, with those credit guidelines. So again, all of these things make a big difference. Let me do uh, one last thing and then I'll try to sum up. I know we've covered a lot. Uh, what's an arm length transaction standard? This will be relevant. So each party agrees to do business when they're acting independently in their own self-interest. You know, so there's no insider deal. Everyone's doing their best. You know, we typically look at transactions and ask, would it be funded in the re real world? And if so, would it be at, at the proposed terms or might it be very different? Um, you know, if, if it's substantially different from the proposed terms, it's, it, we're probably going to start saying it's probably not arm's length transaction. You know, you couldn't get this done. So then the question becomes, why would Maker do this on worse terms you know, than they, they could typically get elsewhere? And I, I, and, you know, I think that this is something to keep in mind. Let me flip to the last slide and I think I'll give you a sense why. Um, Monetalis is also equity funded by several significant uh, token holders and maker token holders, which is a good thing. It's good. They like the business and they believe in it. You know, there's no problem with that. And they've disclosed it. It's not like they're trying to hide it. Let me be clear. This is not something they're trying to hide or get over on us. But the, the challenge here, uh, sorry, is that these token holders and their delegates can vote on the monetalysis funding decision. And the challenge is if, if you know, say you've got 3 million in, in uh, monetalis as an equity investor, if uh, and you can also vote as a maker token holder, if if they approve it, you know that equity position of Monetalis will be worth a lot more with that if, if we give it an, you know a nice funding line. So which book are you or which investment are you really voting? It's just it, it's not a great place to be. You know, I mean, from from the you know, kind of our language in DeFi, we'd say it's an entanglement. You know, they have a serious financial entanglement. In the real world, they say it's a conflict of interest. You know, and both of those, and they could be, you know, I mean, very well-meaning people with very good standards, but there's also a perception question. You know, if this was on the front, if Monetalis got funded, and this was on the front page of the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal, how is this going to look? You know, I mean, I've seen this movie many times, and it is generally not a very pretty ending, you know, when insiders are perceived to be funding something that benefits them in another way. <laughs> And so in, in the, in the um, TradFi world, the entangled voters would be typically required to recuse themselves from all votes where they're entangled. You know, it's not our decision to say what it should be, but we certainly think this is, this is something to think about. You know, I mean, we, we just don't kind of want this entanglement, old, old school TradFi conflict of interest entanglement. I, I don't think we want that here. That's my own opinion. You know, people need to decide. And so... If I had to you know, summarize what's our view on Monetalis, what's the risk assessment summary? And I think it's pretty clear, hopefully, that I'm just summarizing what I've been saying over and hopefully I've demonstrated clearly. If not, please let me know. It's not investment grade, you know, across a whole number of reasons. It's not a great risk readjusted return when we look, you know, what else is out there, even with deals we're currently in discussions with. It's pretty arguably not arm's length transaction because the terms uh, are so so much weaker to maker than what else we could do out there. So it's going to look like, you know, it, it's an insider deal in some shape or form. And then the question becomes why. And then if we do this deal, other arrangers are going to expect the same basic standard. So it's not that we just have Monetalis at 40 million and arguably off market risk. We had, you know, lots of other guys lining up for something similar, you know, which I don't think is a great standard, you know, and, and all, all these different pieces together, I, I would argue, create substantial facility risk. And not just me. I mean, other people in RWA and Luca, you know, I mean, we're, we're aligned on this view. So there's, you know, there's substantial risk to the facility taking a capital hit, but even I think more meaningfully to creating a perception around die stability. You know, what are we investing in? Are these good quality assets with good managers done, you know, with really clean um, governance standards, you know, and transparency? I, I think there's real risk there.
you know, not everyone would agree with me, but that's clearly, you know, our view, having been in this business a long time. So in conclusion, we would suggest Monetalis retire its request or significantly restructure it, you know, to be more in line with kind of how the market does things and more aligned with Maker. I mean, I, I, I hope it's pretty clear some of the key ways we would suggest to be restructured. <laughs> and then we also think uh, Maker should pr uh, prioritize, you know, good investment grade collateral that could be perceived as arm's length, you know, good governance, you know, and, uh, and just good investments where people are going to say, wow, I can hold the die because I know that's money good. Wow, I, I, I pulled it off in an hour. I'm surprised. Uh, do we have some time to chat, guys? I'd love to take questions. I, I know I've gone through a lot. We, we do have a couple of questions, uh, Eric. And if anyone else has uh, additional questions, uh, feel free to type them. Maybe stop sharing the screen so I don't see my... Okay, I think I just... Let me get this. Oops. I was saying, where's the question? Um, so we, before we jump into the general um, into the general questions, uh, I had a, um, a question more related to the to the monetalis deal. So uh, would it be possible for I can't remember who who said this, so I'm, I'm stealing someone's credit, but someone suggested that maybe the investors should form a fund to cover the junior tranche of this uh, deal. Would that be something uh, possible, or, or would that uh, make the deal look uh, better? Uh, it definitely would help. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a fundamental question of why should we be a, a senior secured lender to a monetalis when there's no money under, you know, there's no first loss. That's not a senior lender. Yeah, I mean, them putting in a meaningful slice. It's not every, it wouldn't solve everything, but it, but it's a big first step. Yeah, you know, because we, we don't want a little hiccups and stuff to be giving us a loss. You know, that, that, that should be, you know, the originators should be absorbing the first losses you know, up to a, a pretty robust number. Right. And the other question, I don't know if you have a, um, uh, a view about this, but uh, again, this is not my, my original thought. I'm stealing it again. But uh, how, how do you see this, uh, this governance? Um, so governance trying to push something as monetalis or or, or 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 the community within the forums without uh, without pointing fingers uh, that potentially uh, like cuts your ability to focus on other deals that you were working and then you need to jump onto this one and other deals might get delayed is that the case or 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 not and uh, how do you see a this? lot of effort into this let me just say that yeah you know and every mm -hmm. time you put a lot of effort into a everything else gets less attention but on the other hand, I think it's important that, that Monetalis, I mean, get get carefully reviewed and the community have a full, robust discussion and full transparency on its relative yeah. strengths and weaknesses. So I think it deserves the time. You know, and and um, we want everyone to know exactly what we're doing and how we're viewing it, and they can fully disagree. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the other question, I think it was uh, coming from Makerman. Uh, but is there a way of prioritizing these deals? Uh, how should we approach this and how should it be done? I don't know if you have any opinion about that as well. That's a good question. I, I think, in fact, that's a great question. We should probably have a bigger discussion. I, I don't, I mean, I want to get Will on it and I don't feel I can give it justice in, a, in one minute. It's just too important. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, Asad typed a question on the on the chat and it's how do makers real world assets borrowing rates compared to market rates good question um i think the first thing i want to say is you gotta line try to line up apples and apples you know not apples and oranges so if are, are we looking at lending say against eth and then what's the um uh, uh collateralization you know number or are we looking against Bitcoin and what's the collateralization? And then also, then what? So, what's the specific risk product and structure we're doing in crypto? And then what's the specific product and risk structure you're going to compare that into the real world? I'm not trying to be difficult. It's just in crypto, there's there's, there's a lot less things, but there's still variation, and we have to line it up. Um, and so, I, it's like at the end of the day, you kind of want to say, well, can we benchmark and say these two products, real world crypto, are roughly the same risk, you know, in roughly the same, you know, basic terms. And then what's the, then you can compare the yield. But if one is much riskier than the other, it's not so meaningful. And I think it's, it's a great question. I think we need to spend more time on. 
I feel like, oh boy, it, I, I don't think I can, I haven't given it enough thought, but it's a great question. I feel like we, we need to spend a lot more time and give more thought to it. it it's a great question. Sounds good. Thank you for that. Uh, thanks for the question, I said. And our own Frank Cruz is uh, asking, well, he's saying these are great principles for sure, but what are some of the steps that are taken in TradFi to monitor loans? In other words, who's on the ground visiting sites? Okay, um, it's a good question. So if we are making a loan to an originator, say there's um, an auto lender and we're making a loan to them, then in essence, we're the direct lender and it's going to be on us in some shape or form to have people visiting, you know, uh, management and, you know, making sure their origination and servicing is all being done. And, you know, there's auditing that the, being a traditional lender in private credit is a lot of work. You know, it, it's not, you know, two guys in a Bloomberg. There's a lot to be done. So one of the reasons um, RWA has been focusing more on lending to folks like Monetalis, their asset managers, they are the lender. You know, Alan could be the lender to the auto maker or to the auto lender. So then he's doing all of that work. And so in essence, what we're doing is we're underwriting his ability to underwrite. So he's doing 90, probably 5% of the heavy lifting. And we're just financing his overall book. And we're not financing the whole book. You know, we're financing maybe the top 80%. And then he's got that, you know, first loss piece. So we're outsourcing most of the, of the nitty gritty blocking and tackling and stuff to the asset manager. Um, and, and we're still going to have some work, but it's much more getting comfortable with how they underwrite their their existing deals, manage their whole book. Yeah, so th that's certainly a, why we've been focusing more on that as opposed to us doing individual deals, you know, with, with uh, the primary lender, like the auto lender. It would be a whole lot more work for us and much harder to scale. Nice. Yeah, thanks for, for that. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so... Uh... Eric, uh, where can people find you if, if they want to discuss these things or if they want to reach out privately? What's the oh, best good. way to contact you? Um, it's probably on uh, Discord. Wait, what, what's my, uh, where's my Discord number? Sorry, I don't have it in front of me. Uh, do you see it? <laughs> Apologize. Uh, so it's... Or I'm, yeah, I'm, it's... I'm on, the, um, on the forum at Eumenes, E-U-M-E-N-E-S. So, you know, that's definitely uh, one way to reach out to me. Uh, I apologize. I, I need to look up my my Discord. Uh, oh, here we go. Thank you. 7330. Eric Rapp, it's uh, 7330. Nice. All right. So, yeah, thanks, everyone, for coming and participating. Thanks again, Eric, for joining us. We'll definitely keep the discussion going uh, at forum.makeitout.com. And we'll upload this uh, video soon, TM, to the YouTube channel so everyone can watch it later. Thanks again. Thank you, folks. I really appreciate your time.